I've been doing a lot of thinking over the last few years, so I decided I'd do less of that with this. So hopefully this will be something that you enjoy. We'll find out. If you hate it, that's okay. Just tell me well after. Like in the back. <laughs> All right, so denatured. Why that title? Kind of made me think a little bit about where we are right now. Uh, some of the elements that go into the crises, plural, multiply plural, um, that we're facing right now. Thinking a lot about how we lost community and communion with the natural world and how we might get it back. And uh, mostly this is some ways that have worked for me. Your mileage may vary. Unless we're content with disappearing from the world and taking a hell of a lot of others with us, uh, others with us we urgently need to save the humans by saving the community to which we belong. The biosphere, or what I call the Gaia hood. Okay. So maybe somebody in here had a good 2018, but for most of us, times are rough and people are weird. <laughs> right? right? Everybody's just a little nuts. Well, there's a really good reason for that. And it's been going on for so long, for most of us, and especially for the youngers of us, for whom the current social, emotional, and actual physical temperature has always been higher. We remember, if you look back, that this has been happening for a while. Social and political pressures have become immense. So when you boil lobsters slowly, they often fail to notice the water temperature until the prospect of critical, physical, or emotional failure is imminent. As a mental health professional, I work with low-income, indigent, and homeless individuals as an LCSW and psychiatric social worker at a public hospital. I see and have been seeing the physical and emotional destruction that this situation has foisted on all of us firsthand. It's not pretty. It's pretty horrific. And having been worked into emotional exhaustion myself, I've experienced this personally. In my own case, after 9-11 and the recession that followed, and you here remember that? I think a few of you do. Having been drained by a series of shocks, very much like the ones we're experiencing now, I can tell you being told to be grateful you still have a job, so work harder, <laughs> will only get you so far through this kind of thing before something breaks. I broke, and it took a lot to put myself together. <clears throat> so as a result, I've been tracking this phenomenon for at least the last 16 years. Possibly more if you count being a scrappy high school loudmouth. These stressors that lead to catastrophe in our lives include social pressures, meaning racial, sexual, and gender-related discrimination, along with the normalization of abuse from the political sphere. So what we see has made it okay for people to hurt each other, and we're somehow expected not to respond to them. I don't know about you, but that's pretty hard to do. Big issue for a lot of people that feeds into this is economic pressure. I, I know a thing about that, and some of you probably do too. As a member of the generation that fledged during the recession in the mid to late 1970s, it's just been one damn thing after another, right? I call us the boxer generation. We're sort of between boomers and Gen X. And as a result, I'm keenly aware of the human cost of the death spasms of late stage capitalism. A lot of my anarchist friends, hey, let it all come down. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, but it's coming down on all of us. And even worse, it's coming down on the most vulnerable people, like the people I see every day in my hospital. You know, so from lower income boomers, looks like this is like the survey, right? Of where we are, who's dealing with this? Lower income boomers who 10 years ago lost their retirement savings and any possibility of being hired at an experience appropriate rate to rebuild the financial circumstances for the whole age. The people in my own liminal sub-generation and those Gen X Watergate survivors who sat out political processes and whose disaffection gave a pure libertarianism a shot in the arm. As well as the millennials, forced to start careers a decade late and impossibly in debt. We find ourselves collectively in an unholy mess where most of us are terrified. 
<coughs> We've become marginalized, vulnerable, and profoundly disconnected from our most basic sense of belonging, of being home on the earth, or what I call the Gaia hood. Right? God bless you, Centennials, or Gen Z, or whatever, if there are any of you in the room. Your worst nightmare, <laughs> and I think we share this, are the 26 billionaires who continue to rape the planet, who have more wealth than the remaining 7,700,000 human beings on Earth. And they really don't give a damn about the rest of us. These crazy people somehow think they're going to survive what's going to kill the other almost 8 billion human beings. <laughs> Definition of insanity. Yeah, absolutely. Pick for concession. <laughs> I guess the market. Yes. Speaking of centennials, I, I have to appreciate you and any of you who are parents to these kids because, frankly, their activism is keeping the rest of us going. Absolutely. After yes. all this crap we've all been through, we're tired. It's hard to keep fighting, right? <laughs> You're still doing it. I know you are. I know most of you. You're still fighting, but it's freaking tiring. Seeing someone like this 15, now 16 year old girl, right? You stand up and say exactly what needs to be said to the people it needs to be said to. And more importantly, we all hear and see her doing that. It helps. You know, and this situation she's talking about really points out the trillion pound gorilla in the Gaia hood. That's the approximate weight of the 7 to 8 billion people, if you figure we're about 150 pounds average. The destruction and failure of natural systems in the Anthropocene. That's our part of the So how do we respond? How is it continue? Right? It's a rhetorical question. We're up against it, right? Constant attacks. It's I don't know we're cute, as cute as these guys. Right? But under those circumstances, self-compassion, compassion and empathy, and often our will to act, to go on acting, has been drained by the constant injuries, attacks, and insecurities we all experience. So how do we survive, recover, and revive? You guys, right? You guys. All you guys. <laughs> Speaking colloquially and collectively, right? All beings, biosystems, planet. I'm stepping into taking license to speak poetically of a tool in art, poetry, that I relate most closely to, and which has been most healing for me. Although you may interpret this as poetry of sound, right, if music speaks to you, or poetry of light, painting, photography, and any of the other art forms that are coming into being with you. Right? And this is an ancient magic, the magic of words, which embraces every age and realm of human experience. And those of you in the room are druids, we know this, which can curse or bless with great power. Right? That little girl that we just saw, she's using that power. Although I speak primarily of nature poetry in this invocation to the There is so much poetry in you. So much passion in your sharing of knowledge. I saw that yesterday. I'm seeing it today. I see it in your faces. I hear it in your words. This medium of words and magic, this passion and longing, has the power to bring us directly back into relationship with nature. Reminding we Gaias of our membership and immediate resonance in the Gaia hood. Now we need to remember, we're animal beings who live, eat, sleep, aspire, and love 
like the other animals and other beings we share this planet with. We also need to recall, we also excrete, despair, and die with other animals and other beings, with all the other Gaias in the Gaia hood. We would do well to remember, to remember our membership in the largest community. To recall, in the words of the Nobel winning scientist E.O. Wilson, our biophilia, our desire to affiliate with nature, this innate instinct of love for what created us, what makes up every atom <coughs> of our bodies, right? the air that goes in and out of our lungs and every other animal on this planet. We belong to that community. This is one of my favorite revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rogers, right? Mm -hmm. We live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's not easy to say, it's easy to say it's not my child, not my community, not my work, not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> Not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond. I consider those people my heroes. Right? And that person, Mr. Rogers, walked his talk. So. I think passionately loving the earth and each other as we love beloveds, those we most adore. And making art that reflects this may do what fear cannot. Energize, motivate, and sustain our will to act and save what we love. And there's an art that seems to be speaking to a lot of people right now. <coughs> it's kind of a fascinating thing. It turns out that books of poetry are selling better now than at any time since the advent of the internet. Mm -hmm. Ask a bookseller. One of my favorite current modern memoirs for recalling our relationship is this one, right? The Lost Words. It's fascinating. This is a book for children, and it explicitly calls itself a spell book. In reaction to nature-related words being excised from the Oxford Children's Dictionary, this book seeks to recall and invite the spirit of nature into the hearts of children by using the power of poetry and art. The color giver, fire bringer, flame flicker, rivers quiver, ink black bill, orange throat, and a quick blue back, gleaming feather stream. Neat and still, it sits on the snag of a stick until, with gold flare, wing fan, whip crack, the kingfisher, zingfisher, singfisher, flashes down too fast to follow, quick and quicker carves its hollow. In the water, slings its arrow super swift to swallow stickleback or shrimp or minnow. Halcyon, its other name. Also, ripple calmer, water nester, evening angler, weather teller, rain bringer, and rainbow bird that sets the stream alight with burn and glitter. <laughs> Another way we often forget ourselves is by losing our sense of place. Most nature poetry is a poetics of place. Right? You have to observe those details closely to write about. As animals and ecosystems evolve together, and beings out of place can pose a danger to whole systems. And the most dangerous animal out of place is possible. Forgetting we belong here and to the other Gaias, we pose danger to whole Gaia hood. Remembering by showing up and paying attention puts our feet back on the earth.
making an effort to name and recall our specifics, our places, can heal ourselves and keep us focused on the bigger picture. If I should die in another land, as it seems someday I surely must, sprinkle my dust over California. It is only just I should return. Her ochre grit across my tongue claimed me at birth, and I will never be free. There's more to that poem, but somehow it's not here. <laughs> I'll read it to you later. Another poet of place, Rainbow mm -hmm. Man of Carmel, right? Robinson Jefferson. Nature knows that people are a tide that swells and in time will ebb and all their works dissolve. As for us, we must uncenter our minds from ourselves. We must unhumanize our views a little and become confident as the rock and the ocean we are made from. This is one of my favorites of hers. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper. I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who's eating sugar out of my hand. Who's moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle, blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? When we can imagine ourselves as part of nature, we are nourished by the waters of the imaginal world which is a path many of us who are magicians, healers, and witches walk and draw on the power of in our world. This restores us just as the waters of the earth restores the truth. Seeing the small reminds us that we are small. And seeing the large reminds us of the whole of life. And John Muir said, wilderness is a necessity. I agree with you. All right. I get two more. Can I squeeze them in? Pardon? I have two more poems. Can I squeeze them in? OK. You're right, all you? 20 minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, not too many questions. I won't answer any. Sorry. Right. <laughs> but also, Joy helps us remember joy. Right? Dandelion. 
dazzle me, little son of the grass, and spin me, tiny, tiny machine, tick-tock, sun, clock, thistle, and dawn. Now no longer known as dent in the young, lion's tooth or wind blown, tick-tock, sun, clock, nettle, and dock, evening glow, milk, witch, or parachute. So let new names take root and thrive and grow. Tick, tock, sun, clock, rattle, and dock. I would make you some such as bane of lawn perfectionists, or fallen star of the football pitch, or scatter seed, but never would I call you only merely simply weed. Tick, tock, sun, clock, clover. Being able to grieve with others is something that can restore our own compassion. Taliqui's daughter of Princess Angeline, mother, brother of Gobi, sister to Kiki, mother to Notch. Her second offspring was not born, but born still, unnamed and unnumbered. For five days, Taliqui pushed her stillborn calf around the Salish Sea, perhaps a hope that she'd not be a parent to bury a child, perhaps a grief vigil, the unnamed, unnumbered calf writing dead on her rostrum five days. Taliqua, Cherokee for plains, or a kind of red rice, or just two, or two is enough, or a ferry terminal on Vashon. Five days, says the witnesses from the Whale Museum, sitting Shiva and watching her deep breath. She carried the dead calf 20 miles one day, in her teeth from time to time, through the full ripe thimbleberry moon, through stage one grief, Dinana. We're going to be here as long as necessary for her. Here is what your fairy line idling of your giant truck brings. 108.7 degree low temperatures in Kuryat, Oman. 11 fires in the Arctic Circle. Mama whales pushing around their stillborn calves. Days. But you stay cool in your air conditioned life. You have bigger fish to fry than whales who have no lobby. You idled that engine until the last glacier died, the last salmon leapt, and the last forest burned. These are the stories the children of our children will tell if there are storytellers in their time. How we slept at the switch, ignored the signs of doom. How we were scholars of war and good tweeters. Had nice dinner photographs and saved ourselves from Muslims and immigrants and every vague threat the cruel majority could conjure. While the world burned in one whale mom, did all our crying for us. Naming grief and loss, walking the beloved landscapes inhabited by artists and by lovers, noting every small thing that shapes love and memory, exhorting us to love better and to be better, to participate in the life we share. I challenge you to love enough that you will grieve if you lose this beloved world, to love enough to fight on together and keep from losing it.